I'd like to start with uh, this example, Matillaha Dam on the Ventura River. It's filled with sediment. It poses safety hazards, a uh, large part because of the aggregate that was used to construct it. This is local aggregate, which uh, has a, a, a problem of an alkali aggregate reaction. But of course the dam blocks migration for steelhead trout, which is a, a big deal because there's a lot of excellent steelhead habitat upstream of this dam if they could get there. Um, but the biggest concern with removal of this and other dams like this in California would be the sediment impacts downstream. Simply by uh, letting, pass, letting sediment pass through the dam site and letting it aggrade downstream, that would reduce the channel capacity. So in future floods, uh, whoever touched the dam will suddenly be the subject of lawsuits with uh, uh, every, you know, all people claiming and experts running models to show that it was because of that that this $3 million house flooded. There are three other dams like this uh, in the California coast ranges, or at least there were. Uh, so the Matillaha Dam, Ringe Dam on Malibu Creek, um, Searsville Dam on the San Francisco Creek, uh, just across the peninsula from us here in Berkeley. And then um, San Clemente Dam on the Carmel River, which is no longer there. Um, San Clemente Dam was removed. This is a photo I took uh, uh, some years before the dam was removed. Here's the dam built in 1921 by uh, uh, the predecessor of the Cal American Water Company. And uh, at this point, it was basically filled with sediment, but you can see this huge wedge in the lower part of the Carmel River flowing into the reservoir. And then here's San Clemente Creek, a major tributary. Well, <clears throat> um, the, the issue with removing a dam like this, and, and, and uh, San Clemente Dam was seismically unsafe. It, it seemed that, uh, that the foundation didn't go all the way down to bedrock. It was in... Um, uh, gravel basically so so there was a there was some urgency to remove the dam and that finally happened in 2015 and the way they managed it was they had to manage the sediment they couldn't just let all this go so they um, so they stabilized the sediment in place they cut a channel through this uh, ridge so that they could reroute lower Carmel River through the bed of San Clemente Creek and then it rejoined the original uh, channel bed down here. So it's actually a pretty clever solution to a very difficult problem because there's there would be no way you could truck all that sediment out of there given the state of the roads and the political swing of the people who own the big estates around there. And uh, even things like a, a conveyor belt or, or a sluice pipe uh, that would carry it over the ridge that, that just seemed to be infeasible. So this was a, a you know a pretty successful dam removal, and in this case they had to stabilize the sediment in place. Now more and more we're seeing this trend of dam removal um, in the global north. It's quite the opposite in the global south, where dams are being uh, built like crazy. Uh, but uh, but there have been other examples, most notably on the Elwha River on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, where the Elwha and the Glines Canyon Dam were removed. And um, this is a very different situation because unlike the dams in California that I mentioned, all of which have very high priced real estate downstream right along the banks of the river uh, and sediment issues. So as sediment comes downstream, you're gonna have all these problems. Uh, on the Elwha, the downstream reaches were not populated and they were mostly owned by the uh, Indian tribe Clallam Indian tribe, who was pushing to get the dams removed. And in this case, the dams were owned by uh, a, 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 a lumber mill, and they were perfectly happy to accept some substitute power and have these dams taken off their hands because in terms of uh, trying to relicense those with FERC, uh, that would have been a nightmare for them. Uh, but we see also this tendency to uh, remove some dams um, in Europe. This is a poster from uh, an NGO in France on the Loire River, uh, where they have been removing some dams to try to uh, open up habitat in the upper Loire and the, and the, and the Allier, a big tributary. Okay, but uh, 
the the biggest project so so far the um, the Elwa is the biggest dam removal we have certainly in the U.S. Um, but that will be dwarfed by the Klamath River dam removals, which are are planned for dams on the on the Klamath. Um, and uh, originally the U.S. government was going to contribute to this. Congress never came through for uh, political reasons. Uh, but the other parties, the tribes, the states, the NGOs, and the owner of the dams, Pacific Corps, reached an agreement to remove the dams anyway. And that, uh, that's been set back about a year because of COVID issues, but, uh, but it, I think it will, will finally happen. Uh, and they would start some of the preparation work in about a year. So dam removal is very exciting. Um, it's a very popular topic with students. But uh, the reality is most dams are here to stay and we are building new dams in the global south way faster than any dams are being taken out uh, in, in the industrialized world. So really the question is how do we live with these dams and how to prolong the reservoir life, which is threatened by sedimentation in many cases. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But I wanted to look a little bit at the dams in California and uh, my PhD student Toby Minear and I asked the question, how quickly will they fill up? We were motivated by places like the Matillaha and San Clemente. And you know, how common is this? <clears throat> well, we have uh, over 1400 dams statewide. These are dams large enough to be regulated by the Division of Safety of Dams. Um, and uh, um, you know, as you can see, mostly for irrigation, but uh, all sorts of purposes. We developed something called the 3W model, which estimates long-term sediment yields from existing sedimentation records in this case. So, so we scoured the, uh, the databases and the literature um, and contacted some agencies to get sediment yields for as many reservoirs as we could in the state of California. And then we, uh, we use the existing uh, geomorphic province delineations that have been developed uh, before by the California Geologic Survey and other experts. And then within each of these geomorphic provinces, we compiled all the reservoir sedimentation data so that we could come up with median sediment yields for those regions for each province. And the, the kind of disappointing thing was how few data there are out there. Very few of these reservoirs have had sedimentation surveys. And many of the sedimentation surveys that uh, you can find now, the data, they're from the 40s or the 50s, uh, which is really kind of surprising because anyway, people were more concerned about the issue then evidently than they are now. And it was a way more work to do it at that time. I mean, today we've got sonar, we can go out, I mean, our, our biggest error now is just trying to reconstruct what the pre-dam topography was because we have, you know, you know, at best 20 foot contour maps to, to, to deal with uh, for the pre-condition, but we can get the current condition very quickly and, and easily, cheaply and, and accurately. But, uh, but very few reservoirs have had sedimentation surveys. Um, but anyway, we took the rates that there were and then we applied those to uh, the entire province and unmeasured reservoirs within the, each geomorphic province. And our model accounts for having multiple dams in the same basin. So, so if you are trying to estimate the sediment yield from the sediment that's accumulating in uh, reservoir A, you take into account that there's reservoir B, C, and D upstream, and those are already trapping sediment. And then as these uh, uh, reservoirs fill with sediment, their trap efficiency changes. So we came up with the sediment yields by geomorphic region. Um, some of these are influenced by, you know, uh, very low ends, but, uh, uh, but we use these to highlight where we would expect future problems. And they are basically in the transverse and coast ranges of California, where we see uh, a lot of the problems emerging. And that's of course where we have the big four already, Malibu, uh, Matillaha, uh, San Clemente and, and Searsville. But if you see here, these are our projections for reservoirs that would have less than 25% of their capacity remaining today or 10 years ago, this is 2009. So these would be the, the, the red dots. And uh, um, some of these up here are really small um, kind of inconsequential reservoirs, but a lot of these are, are, you know, are enough to create problems. Uh, the 
the Tullaha Dam is estimated to, that'll cost $111 million to remove. Uh, the uh, San Clemente Dam of the Carmel, the, the price tag was given at, at 85 million, but that was over, that, that was price tag was out there like five years before the dam was actually removed. And I'm sure it turned out to be way more than that in the end. So these are very expensive things to deal with when they fill up. And as I mentioned, our study was extrapolating from very limited data. And we were surprised at how little data there were. Um, inspired by these results, Senator Pavley introduced SB 1259 in 2014, which would have directed DWR to collect data on the rate of capacity loss in California reservoirs. So the bill made it through the Appropriations and Natural Resources Committees, but it didn't get through the Senate itself. So it died. So I, I was surprised that collecting data on something as basic as this was controversial, but anyway, there, there were some interests that were opposed to this. So we can blissfully go on in ignorance and uh, you know, we don't have to worry about it. We have no information, so therefore the problem doesn't exist, but our grandkids will be able to deal with it uh, in due time. Now, um, there are a number of safety hazards with sediment-filled dams, especially in, uh, in seismic country. Um, and, uh, and I know, uh, you know Anderson Dam on Coyote Creek is a perfectly good example. Uh, but looking at uh, <clears throat> this dam, I, I find this uh, a fascinating case study. This is Barlin Dam on, um, on the Dahan River in Taiwan. So the, there's a big reservoir on the Dahan River called the Xumen Reservoir. It provides water for Taipei and also for the Taichung um, area, the, the uh, Silicon Valley of, of Taiwan, which is uh, near the uh, Taiwan International Airport, the Taipei International Airport. So uh, Ximen Reservoir uh, has been filling rapidly with sediment. And um, one of the strategies that was used to try to uh, slow down was build 108 small dams upstream to capture sediment before it would get to the reservoir. And this Barlin Dam, one of these wars, had an original capacity of 10 million cubiters. It was built in the 1980s. By September 2004, it was full of sediment. In July 2007, you see it's full of sediment. Well, then there was a typhoon in September of that year which caused the dam to fail. So within a few hours, it released most of that 10 million cubic meters of sediment. So uh, about three quarters of it. Uh, and um, what happened? There's a 10 kilometer reach before you hit the next uh, dam like this called Rongwa Reservoir. And the sediment uh, settled out in that reach and in Rongwa Reservoir and basically filled up Rongwa Reservoir. We used to joke that this is the wrong way to uh, to manage sediment in a river like this. Uh, this idea that you would build a bunch of small dams to trap sediment um, and then just leave them there, and uh, it, it, and, not, and that you're not creating just a whole bunch of new problems across the landscape that you're going to have to somehow maintain or deal with. Uh, anyway, this this uh, approach has never really made much sense to me. We we're very lucky in this case that no one lives in that canyon downstream. There are just like a couple of road crossings. Um, no one was killed. And the downstream channel and Rongwa were able to absorb that sediment. So there was really uh, no consequence of this except the fact that it was a little embarrassing for the uh, Taiwan Water Resources uh, Agency. Globally, we are losing a lot of reservoir capacity to sedimentation. And even, I think even with the current uh, dam building boom, although maybe, the, may, maybe we're gonna be building dams so quickly now that uh, we'll uh, actually start to compensate for this, but uh, temporarily. But since the seventies, we've been losing more reservoir capacity to sedimentation that has been gained by building new reservoirs. This is from uh, George Annadale's book, Quenching the Thirst. So it's a global problem. 
um, this loss of reservoir capacity. So that should motivate some interest in, in sustainable strategies to manage sediment, which I'll, I'll get to later. But now I'd like to talk about the downstream effects of trapping the sediment into the reservoirs and releasing sediment starved water. So in general, when you release sediment starved flow from the dam, you have excess energy that leads to channel incision and that will undermine infrastructure, uh, cause channel widening and destabilization, uh, drop in the alluvial water table adjacent, which has been a big problem in many places, including France, loss of, of habitats, and uh, ultimately coastal erosion because of the uh, loss of sediment supply. And this sediment starvation is frequently compounded by mining of sand and gravel from river channels. There are many ecological effects as well, uh, mostly channel simplification because uh, the gravel that creates gravel bars and riffles, undulations in the bed, that gets blown out downstream and you are left with a, a, a greatly simplified channel. Uh, and uh, you often see the channel narrowing and fossilizing by vegetation encroachment. And where the dam is large, and it also reduces the frequency of scouring floods that could allow trees to establish in the active channel and you get this vegetation encroachment problem. Now you don't get hungry water, as we call it, sediment starved hungry water below every dam. It depends on the balance between the transport energy and the sediment that's available for a given river reach. So if the sediment supply is reduced more than the transport energy, then you get hungry water. So there's more energy to move sediment than the sediment is still available. But on the other hand, you can have a dam that's it's so big that it uh, cuts off the floods, cuts off the high flows, such and and maybe you have a big tributary downstream that's delivering sediment and the river is no longer to move that so these would be a case where you have sediment surplus below the dam jack schmidt and peter wilcock did uh, an analysis of uh, a number of major rivers in the western u.s to identify reaches that were in sediment surplus and some in sediment deficit the ones in red are sediment deficit and uh, I'll draw your attention to this reach right here. This is Glen Canyon Dam, and this is the reach downstream in sediment deficit down to the confluence of the Little Colorado. Um, and uh, uh, and by the way, most mostly we are seeing reaches in sediment deficit. That's certainly true of rivers globally. But this reach below Glen Canyon Dam is interesting because in the Colorado uh, River that goes through Marble and Grand Canyon you have these uh, sandbars that are essential for the river rafting trips. I mean, there, there are species that depend on these as well, but uh, uh, the, the main species really is Homo sapiens for having a place to pitch the tent and camp during these raft trips. And, and these beaches have been eroding. So, uh, so there's now a very complicated kind of system. Uh, there was a, it's, it's really interesting. There was a record of a decision in the EIS and everything based on one interpretation of the science. Um, and that was later revised based on uh, further information. The science, you know, the, the, uh, the, the conceptual model was changed. Uh, but, but now the way they manage it is when they have a high flow from the Perea River bringing in sediment, then they make a release from, from Glen Canyon to suspend that sediment so that it will, will go out onto the sandbars and deposit on the sandbars. But uh, as a way of actually increasing the amount of sediment available, not simply manipulating what's there, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation developed a proposal to dredge sand from a tributary delta a few uh, kilometers upstream of the dam, pipe it through a slurry pipe, and then dump it into the river downstream of the dam. To build that would cost about 23 million, to operate it each year would cost between two and three million. So, Thinking at the uh, river system scale, we have our coastal areas that are dependent on sediment supplied from the river basin. Uh, dams, of course, reduce this. Uh, sand and gravel mining in rivers is also a, a big uh, uh, cause of, of sediment deficit. And again, most of the rivers worldwide have, have had a reduction in their sediment loads. Uh, the Mississippi is a pretty good example of this. Um, 
when you look at uh, what the sediment lows were like, you know, let's say a couple hundred years ago, um, and then today, uh, the Missouri was, of course, the biggest sediment source to the to the Mississippi River system, and with the the series of dams on the on the Missouri, uh, that's been uh, basically cut off. So um, when we look at uh, the future of the Mississippi Delta, it's it's not very encouraging. Um, we can, you know, there are a lot of things we can do, and we can uh, have the uh, sediment diversions and whatnot. But uh, but the amount of sediment coming into the delta is way less than it was uh, originally. I've worked uh, quite a bit on the Mekong Delta, which is a really interesting place for a number of reasons. Um, but it's one of the big river deltas in the world that is threatened by sediment starvation. 7,000 years ago, the coast was at Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And over the last 7,000 years, the delta has prograded to its current form because of the very healthy sediment supply from the, uh, uh, from the Mekong River. Now the delta for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, it has started retreating because of the reduction in sediment supply. Um, mostly uh, the immediate cause of reduction is, is extensive mining of sand from all the channels of the Delta and, and the main river upstream coming into the Delta. Um, but uh, the long-term problem will be dams, which will uh, reduce sediment even getting down towards the Delta. The Mekong drops from the Tibetan Plateau. So it's got a tremendous uh, drop, tremendous head, and, and it's uh, got a lot of uh, flow as well. So it's got all, all the ingredients you need for hydropower. And this has not gone unnoticed. Uh, there were, well, it's, it's, it's fascinating just to see all the grand schemes for, for building out the hydropower potential in, in the Mekong. Um, but uh, the Chinese have already done a lot. They've built uh, uh, seven big dams on the main stem. And uh, there are dozens more under construction on tributaries. This is in this lower reach of the main stem. And then, uh, and then farther up, as you get into the Tibetan Plateau, there are tons more that are under construction. Uh, this upper part of the Mekong in China called the Lansang was formerly uh, supplying 50% of the river sediment. So it used to have something like 160 million tons per year on average, 140 to 160 million. Uh, which is uh, based on some of the earliest uh, measurements that we have going back to the 70s, 60s and 70s, but also the long-term rates of, uh, of, of sediment accumulation in the Delta um, and offshore. So as we, uh, as we see these Chinese dams have gone in and then in the lower basin, so that would be Laos, uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, we have uh, more dams planned a lot more dams planned. And uh, we asked the question, if all these dams were going to be built as originally planned, what would be the effect on the sediment delivery to the Delta? So we adapted our 3W model from California to the Mekong, which required quite a bit of adaptation because we didn't have existing uh, reservoir sedimentation rates to, to, to extrapolate. So we did it mostly based on geology and the few data that did exist, mostly uh, uh, measurements of sediment transport. We found that uh, well over 90% of the natural sediment load would be trapped along most of the main stem. And by the time you get to the Delta, there would be only about 4% of the natural sediment load that will reach the Delta. So of course you can ask, you know, what would be the effects of this extreme reduction and sediment load. Um, and looking all along the river, we have an alternation of bedrock and alluvial reaches, but much of the river is bedrock. You know, there, there are deposits of, of sand that you see. And, and when you look from, um, when you look at aerial imagery, you see a lot of sand, but when you're in the field, you see that most of this is maybe two meters thick and it's not gonna take long for that to get flushed out. Um, and and so um, so we will have, uh, for example, the the alluvial reach from Vientiane down to Savannah Cat. Uh, that will certainly um, uh, in size, but uh, the bedrock reaches uh, above and below there. There's not that much sediment you can get out of those. So uh, there'll be a pretty massive incision 
on the alluvial reaches and, uh, and uh, getting down into the delta. And the delta itself will simply not have the sediment supply that's needed to balance uh, natural subsidence and coastal erosion. And then on top of that, we have more problems, which I'll mention here. So this uh, delta landform, like any delta, it can't then maintain itself against the rising sea levels and coastal erosion of the long run. Uh, but there are other drivers, including most sand, which I mentioned. The subsidence has been accelerated by pumping of groundwater. And then of course there's globally accelerated sea level rise and whatever sediment reaches the Delta now is increasingly shot out to the, to the sea because the, the distributaries have been channelized and diked. So there's no way for the sediment to even get out onto the Delta plain and deposit where as it should be doing. Uh, the Delta is virtually all less than two meters above sea level. And uh, when we project this, um, into the future, we see that by 2100, about 90% of the delta will be underwater. If business as usual continues, pumping the groundwater, mining the sand, building the dams as they are being built today, which is without any sediment management. So we, uh, we, we did this by combining different kinds of data, vertical um, subsidence data with volumes of sediment coming into the delta and converting those all with this, what we call the Delta plane model. So um, not to belabor this, but when we apply the model using um, historical rates of natural sediment supply, we, we uh, were able to replicate the kind of aggradation that we have seen um, over the last uh, thousands of years. But when we uh, run the model into the future with the current, um, with the, the current business as usual practices, we see this uh, uh, massive uh, subsidence that will continue. And, and given the topography of the Delta, that means that uh, you know, by 2100, 90% will be underwater. Um, it would be possible to slow this down if we were to stop this uh, crazy pumping of groundwater, if we were to stop the mining of sand from the channels, and if we were to build the, the future dams to pass sediment uh, we could slow it down and prolong the life of the Delta. The Delta has a population, depending on where you draw the line, of 17 to 20 million people. It uh, produces 95% of the rice that uh, is exported by Vietnam. And that translates to something like, I don't know, between 2 and 4% of the global protein um, that's traded around the world. It's an incredibly important place. Uh, but... Uh, and when you look at the, the official Mekong Delta Plan, which was done with the Dutch and the and, and Vietnamese, or the World Bank documents, um, they, they all just sort of assume the Delta is going to be there forever. And, uh, and we, we've been trying to argue, well, well no, in fact, th that's not to be taken for granted. A lot of these wonderful projects that are being done could be viewed as rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic because uh, the very existence of the Delta is, is questionable. So what are some strategies to sustainably manage sediment in reservoirs and regulated rivers? So the, the real idea, if you wanna both maintain reservoir capacity and compensate for downstream sediment supply, uh, you try to pass sediment through or around dams to restore this continuity of sediment transport. And you can do that with bypasses, by sluicing the sediment or routing the sediment through the reservoir, flushing sediment that's been deposited in the reservoir or mechanically removing it and placing it in the downstream channel. Um, this latter option is done in Japan and some places in Europe. Uh, we, there are only two examples I know of in, in California where this has been done. Um, and because of the impacts on habitat downstream. There are a number of projects to mechanically add sediment to the channel below the dam, but usually it's easier to get that sediment from someplace else than the reservoir itself. So you are kind of dealing at least partially with this downstream sediment starvation problem, but you're not helping prolong the life of the, of the reservoir. So looking at some um, diagrams of these approaches, uh, sediment bypassing where it works is a wonderful solution. This is Nagel Dam in South Africa, where the uh, reservoir 
the river takes this big bend. The dam is here, so the reservoir is on the bend. They simply uh, cut a channel through this ridge, which uh, through which they divert the sediment-laden flood flows. And so those uh, sediment-laden flood flows rejoin the river below the dam. Um, and so the continuity of sediment through the system is maintained and the, the reservoir is not filled with sediment. Uh, that's the perfect uh, geometry to have a, a bend like that. But even when you don't have that, you can still make it work with the right engineering. This is a, a, a bypass tunnel designed by, by uh, Tetsuya Sumi and, and his colleagues on the um, Miwa Dam in Japan. And, uh, and this uh, Miwa Dam was built in 1959, but uh, it was filling with sediment so fast that they built the bypass tunnel in 2005. I mean, it's a shame they didn't build a bypass tunnel right off the bat, then they would have maintained their capacity the whole time. But, uh, but now they're able to maintain about half of the capacity by, by uh, using this bypass. So, so the dam still functions. Sediment sluicing refers to moving the sediment not around the dam, but through the dam. And you basically draw the reservoir down so that the river flows in and through the reservoir essentially as a river. Um, and uh, this requires large low level outlets in the dam so that you can release the water fast enough for this to happen. Um, and this is following the, the Chinese velocity, release muddy water, store clear water. Of course, it's most effective for sand size and smaller sediments that can be uh, 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 suspended through turbulence. It also works best in long narrow reservoirs, usually small ones but with steep side slopes. Um, but an exception to the small rule is Three Gorges Dam, which is a very big reservoir, but it is very long, narrow, and has steep slopes. And that's, that's basically the strategy that is intended to keep the Three Gorges from filling up with sediment over time. Um, but you can even do some sediment routing through uh, or with a completely different geometry like John Redmond Reservoir in Kansas. It's uh, essentially circular in plan, but minor changes in the operation, simply reducing the flood detention time have resulted in decreased trap efficiency. So, so prolonging the reservoir. Here you're talking about like improvements of like one or 2%, but it's still something. It's still worth a, a lot of money if you cost it out. Then some of the sediment that's settled out already, it's still possible to flush that through the system. Um, and that usually requires drawing the reservoir down. And, uh, and then often you have to get out there with heavy equipment to, to uh, uh, loosen up the sediment, which has set in place uh, over time. There are a lot of issues with flushing. Um, one thing it's been done often during um, uh, low flow periods during the summer, and uh, there have been a lot of controversy of PG&E doing this and some of their um, um, hydroelectric dams. Um, and uh, a lot of the sediment often will, uh, you know, from the bottom, it will, it will have a lot of organic material, so it'd be anoxic. And uh, this anoxia can kill everything for, you know, a couple of kilometers downstream. So, so flu flushing's gotten a bad rap because of this, but if it's done at the right time of year at high flow, it's not necessarily uh, so bad. Um, and like sluicing, flushing works best in hydrologically small reservoirs. This is a plot by uh, um, uh, Tetsuya Sumi, but, uh, but this, the, the, the issues have been documented with uh, many systems, including the Ebro Basin. On the Rhone River, going from Switzerland to France, um, the, the sluicing uh, or flushing rather has been done to uh, get rid of the accumulated sediments. And this is largely motivated because the uh, Genesiat Dam, uh, which is uh, in Switzerland, just above the French border, uh, if, if that fills up with too much sediment, it creates backwater that floods Geneva at the downstream end of, of Lake Geneva. So, uh, and here you see, this is the Rhone coming out of Lake Geneva, and this is the Arc coming down from Mont Blanc. And uh, so this is glacial meltwater with tons of sediment. And that's really where the sediment that, that accumulates in the Genesiat Dam comes from. So they, they flush this every uh, few years. Um, this was from the 2012 flushing operation. 
uh, and you can see the, the accumulation of all this um, fine grained sediment in the in the in the dam um, upstream of the upstream, upstream of the dam, and then they're uh, releasing it through here. Now this is uh, uh, you know unlike some parts of the world, this is a place with a lot of uh, attention, uh, a lot of uh, 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 scrutiny, and so as a result, the, the Compagnie Nationale du Rhone, which operates uh, the uh, the French dams just downstream, they basically put everybody into action. Even the you know the, the person that answers the phone and sorts the mail, they all they're all pressed into service to go out and monitor different parts of the system. And similarly on the French on the Swiss side, and basically they they they're they're allowed a certain concentration of, of sediment uh, that they can do, and so they have to play around with. Um, with the with releasing water from the bottom outlets, which would have a lot of sediment, uh, against water that they release from the top outlets, which are basically sediment free, so that they can maintain um, the the sediment concentrations below the the requirements. Um, and this uh, this has worked. This system has worked. It's uh, over time. It has prevented uh, the, the 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 bed from uh, aggregating too much in Genesiet Dam and uh, has prevented flooding in Geneva. Now I won't talk too much about this, but I think it is kind of interesting. This is uh, <clears throat> not as interesting to the lake manager, but, uh, but uh, for me, a river guy, I'm fascinated with how the changes in the sediment load have affected habitats and, and channel geomorphology. And, <clears throat> and so there are a lot of projects to artificially add gravel to rivers below dams. Um, we call it gravel augmentation or replenishment. And most of the projects have been done to restore fish habitat. Um, originally, these were usually building artificial riffles where they would go in and try to create the form that they wanted. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, rivers being rivers, those things usually wash out at some point, everyone gets upset. So more and more, the approach is as illustrated here to inject gravel for redistribution by flows. This is a Keswick Dam, the re-regulating reservoir below Shasta. And here you've had uh, dump trucks have been dumping uh, this tongue of sediment uh, into, the, into the river. All right, so um, in Northern California, we have added gravel below many dams, uh, well over 500,000 cubic meters of uh, gravel added. Uh, and, and, and it's going up all the time. Um, and uh, the biggest projects in the Sacramento River, Clear Creek, um, Middle American and Trinity. Um, these are some of the early projects, artificial riffles designed to create directly spawning habitat. But uh, again, these tend to wash out. So now we have more the injection, either the kind of uh, uh, stockpile that, uh, that I showed you before there below Keswick or uh, during the, during the high flows themselves, this is a conveyor belt that's dumping gravel into the Trinity River below Lewiston Dam. Um, this is, it, it's relatively easy to set this up because the high flow releases there, well, these are deliberate flushing flow releases that are, that are uh, made from the dam. But the biggest gravel augmentation project that we have anywhere is not for habitat, but for infrastructure. So it's, it's kind of unusual. It's on the Rhine below the barrage Ifesheim, and there they add gravel to compensate for the sediment deficit um, from the series of dams upstream. There are two barges that operate 355 days a year. On average, they, they add 170,000 cubic meters of gravel and sand. And that's enough to meet the current sediment transport capacity of the Rhine. Um, the, uh, the actual amount of sediment that they add depends on the number of days over a certain threshold. I think it's uh, 1,250 QMAX, something like that. Uh, but they, it's all, th this is actually, actually from the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, 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 Germany was required to build these dams, hydroelectric dams for the benefit of France and this below this lower one. So this is now written into the treaty, the, the composition of the gravel and sand and so on. It's pretty fascinating. So here's a, here's a diagram of the, of the barge dropping the, the, the gravel. It goes downstream when it, when it uh, comes abreast of this uh, pilot boat, then the barge operator knows he should start opening up the barrage 
the, the barge and uh, releasing the gravel. And that's what we see happening here. And whoosh, there goes the gravel. And then the, the barge turns around and goes and gets another load. OK, so um, just recapping these uh, um, strategies for sustainably managing sediment and regulated rivers. If you can sluice the incoming sediment or flush the accumulated sediment, and this usually takes large low level outlets and it requires that you periodically draw the reservoir down. Um, I didn't include a slide in here mentioning um, the, that there's a, another kind of flushing that you can do, um, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's called turbidity current venting. So if you know a turbidity current is coming into your reservoir, you can open your large outlets in the in the dam and uh, and and let that turbidity current pass through. And uh, th this is a, a phenomenon that happens more often than you might think. Um, and uh, the Chinese have really per perfected this in uh, Xiamansha Reservoir, in the Yellow River. Uh, they uh, they get these turbidity currents frequently, and and they have worked it out where they are able to vent these and. Uh, Get rid of the majority of the incoming sediment. They can they can uh, pass downstream through that, um, and then you can pass sediment through uh, bypass tunnels, as, as as we saw the example in um, Miwa Dam and and also uh, in South Africa, and reduce the sediment yield from the river basin upstream of the reservoir. Okay, I didn't I didn't talk much about that because. This is something that there, there are many other benefits from, from doing this. You know, if you have uh, uh, conservation of, of uh, agricultural land, um, uh, approaches like this to retain the soil fertility, there are a lot of benefits of that, but it's very difficult to get these approaches to pencil out for uh, the reservoir itself, for sustaining the capacity of the reservoir. Um, now, so we have the, this, this toolbox of things that we can apply, but they are very rarely implemented. And I think the, uh, the reason is really just the way dams are designed, the, 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 the problem of the economics. I, you know, I'm not going into that in this talk, but um, dams are usually designed based on, on, um, on the uh, uh, discount rate. And the, this whole, um, the, 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 the whole approach ignores the fact that good dam sites are a very limited resource. They are a non-renewable resource. And uh, most of the good dam sites, certainly in the developed world, have already been taken. You know, when you look at how uh, uh, CalFed was struggling to find uh, good places to build another reservoir, um, you know, it's it's pretty clear that uh, uh, we're, we're just uh, fooling around with a dread dregs now. I mean, we, we had the really good dam sites are already taken. So, um, so, there, so there's a lot of reasons why we should be trying to maintain our reservoir capacity. And I would say that, uh, you know, one of, certainly in California, one of the first things should be uh, having some information about what is the re remaining reservoir capacity, how quickly are we losing it, uh, get a little more information that might then inform us of a way that we can maintain this. We can't just blindly assume that we fill up the existing reservoirs, we're gonna build new ones. No, that's not gonna work or, or it's gonna be really expensive and there'll be a lot more impacts to do it. Plus, uh, you know, try, build, try building a big project nowadays with the uh, permitting requirements. Okay, so um, I draw your attention to these two references. They are both available online, open access. Um, Greg Morris, his book, Reservoir Sedimentation Handbook, is uh, really, uh, it, it is the classic in the field. And uh, um, it was published by McGraw-Hill. And their, um, uh, whatever, their rights to the book expired uh, was about uh, five or 10 years ago. And um, uh, Greg said, well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll take the rights. And then Greg just had it scanned and put it online as an ebook. Anyone can download it, um, and that's uh, that's been a great resource for people all over the world. Um, and 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 you have to fill out a little form, you know, where, where you're from. So Greg has got this tally of you know people from all over the world getting the, this book. Um, more recently, um, um, 
this this paper that we published with Greg and George Annandale and and uh, Tetsuya Sumi and others uh, on sustainable management um, of sediment and reservoirs and regulated rivers. This is uh, in the first year of the of the AGU publication Earth's Future, and uh, and this is an open access journal. So if you just type this title in, it'll come right up, and you can download it for free. This is uh, uh, you know somewhat updated. Uh, and of course, way shorter than the book. Uh, so it's a, it's a good sort of introduction to the kinds of things that, that I've been talking about today. So uh, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Matt, that was a great talk. Um, we got some questions in the chat and so I'll just kind of be going over those to you. Um, but I had, a, I had a quick question at first. Um, what are some of the political objections to measuring uh, sediment ca capacity in reservoirs? Um, I wasn't involved in, in, in that, but uh, what I was told is that some of the districts didn't want uh, problems to be exposed. And I don't really see why I would think that, the, you know, if the problems are exposed, that would be motivation for them to get more money to solve them. But... <laughs> But apparently that was it. I guess you, it's not there if you don't see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this one's from Casey Walker. Casey's a potential UCSB master's student interested in research on the Ventura River and the Matillaha Dam. Wondering if you have any ideas for research, any research ideas or research topics involving Matillaha Dam. Interesting. And um, in my river restoration class now, I have a a student who's uh, who, who's from um, Ventura County, and um, and she's uh, she's been trying to figure out a, something to do for her term project on uh, on Matillaha. Um, well, w one thing I suggested to her, but that, you know, it's it's not it's going to be a little too unrealistic, is. Um, you, you have the models that are that are done predicting how much aggradation there's going to be and so on and 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 the one thing you can be sure is when you have a flood um, if uh, you know one of these mansions gets damaged in the flood they're going to hire an expert and and uh, and attorneys who are going to say it's because of whatever you did at the dam you know <laughs> so um, uh, but uh, doing um, doing an inventory of what's downstream um, could be quite interesting. Um, and uh, uh, there's, you know, usually when these models are run, people, maybe they go in the field and they have a look up and downstream of a couple of bridges, but uh, they don't walk out the whole thing. So, um, so that's, uh, that's something I find is often really uh, enlightening. It's just to walk the whole reach and, and, uh, and see what, uh, what you discover. Um, the, um, but I'd be, but Casey, I'd be happy if you wanted to get in touch sometime. I'll, I'm sure uh, my brain will engage on the topic a little bit more, um, and uh, might have some other more substantive suggestions for you. Right, uh, Joe Sullivan asks: Are there any success stories of using sediment bypass channels in California? Uh, no, not in California. What uh, the the biggest success of any of these? kinds of uh, strategies, I would say, is on the Middle American at, at Ralston um, after Bay or Four Bay, I forget what that one is, but, uh, but there they, uh, they had a problem of, uh, of, of sediment accumulation in the reservoir. They excavated about 50,000 cubic yards, about half of that they put in the river channel downstream and the other half they, they put in a, a, you know, like a disposal site, you know, it was just like a waste product. Um, and uh, the reason they didn't put the whole thing in, in there is they were a little f afraid, you know, that, that there would be too much. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, the, 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 the sediment washed out um, with the first high flow. I forget if it was the next year or a couple of years later. Um, uh, so that's, that's the only example we have of actually taking sediment out of the reservoir and mechanically putting it in the channel downstream. On the San Gabriel River uh, in the uh, Los Angeles County, uh, they actually have been pretty forward thinking about managing sediment in the San Gabriel River, but they got uh, too many objections from people. But they actually were uh, uh, 
uh, flushing sediment out of the upstream reservoir. There's like three or four reservoirs in a row. But they were actually they were actually doing this, and you could see that the reservoir the sediment accumulating in the next reservoir, and then they flushed into the next one. Um, uh, so anyway, I think I think they were on a pretty good track. But uh, but but people objected. There were you know there's always something that changes when you when you uh, release sediment, especially people get used to having no sediment, a nice clean you know clear water and nice clean river, and then suddenly there's all this sediment. That's that's to many people in many people's eyes that's like a, a, a you know an environmental problem. So we need education, <laughs> public education. Sediment's good up to a point. Uh, Carrie Austin asks, uh, would a biblical storm like the one that occurred in 1861 to 1862 would mean for sediment loads into an existing reservoir? And will they hold up? Mm, very good question. Well, I think you, uh, your answer is implied in your question. <laughs> there, there will be, yeah, I, I'll go on record of predicting that there will be some reservoirs that will fail. In a, in a repeat of the 1862 storm. Probably not a, I'm probably not going out too, more, too far on a limb to say that. Uh, Mike Cox asks, uh, should gravel mining return wet screen fines to the stream rather than impoundment? Interesting. Um, a lot of that I'd say depends on when. If, uh, if you return the fines during the, the winter high flows, um, it, it's probably okay. It would probably just get lost in the noise. If you do it during the summer low flow, it would be probably a disaster. Uh, next from Bill Taylor, uh, what's the cost effectiveness of digging bypass tunnels? versus the age and structural integrity of older dams? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I follow. So the so how much it would cost to build a bypass? Um, in other words, is it worth it given that some of the dams are so old and of uh, questionable uh, integrity? Bill, could you unmute and clarify? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, Dams are really expensive to build. Yeah. And we have tunneling machines that can do a pretty good job of going around them. But uh, eventually, these things, like you say, you can only build so many dams, and then you run out of options on them. So if you want to save them, and I know they're all different sizes and, and capacities and all of that, but would there be a point where that would be cost effective to? Yeah, this. yeah. Um, well, I, just thinking about the the Miwa example, you know, they they let it roughly fill halfway with sediment by the time they got motivated to to build that bypass tunnel. Um, this is Miwa Dam in Japan. Um, it was, you know, and and it still functions. It still, you know, it still um, generates power and diverts water and so on. So, um, so I guess it. It's it's probably you know of course a case by case kind of analysis, but um, you know given the lack of good dam sites sitting out there waiting for us to build in, um, I think you know all the dams that we have now we have to treat as um, uh, as important assets that we should you know prolong their life as much as possible. So I would think in many cases it, it would make sense. This is this would be a great thing, you know. I think the first thing is, you know, have DWR figure out which reservoirs are filling with sediment, how fast. And uh, and I know there was some discussion back and forth where they didn't want to do all the dams in the state, but they were going to try to prioritize certain ones, which is fine. But then I think a next step could be trying to answer your question. And for for a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these dams. Have, I'm sure it does make economic sense, and, and for some others, it probably doesn't. Um, but there, but we we could probably figure out ways of uh, making a fairly quick assessment of that um, initially before doing a detailed study. 
Uh, Kenneth LaRue has two questions. So the first one is, what are your thoughts on the long-term viability and implications of gravel augmentation since this, this method leaves the water starved of fine sediments? <clears throat> yeah. Um, now, so there are in some cases it, below smaller dams, the smaller dams can pass uh, more of the fine sediment. So it just depends on what's the capacity of the dam. It's usually we call, talk about the impoundment ratio. If the if the dam is um, impounds you know five percent of the annual flow or less, usually usually it can pass a certain amount of the of the fines around. So it might not be fine sediment starved so much, and and the fines would be moving at the natural time of the year. Um, I would say the the but but your broader question of how sustainable is this? I think that's really a, a good question. Um, you know, I did my uh, dissertation research on gravels, and I I love gravel, um, and I am always excited to see gravel being put in rivers below dams. But um, you know, how sustainable is that really? Um, and uh, it was it was only uh, the mid '90s when uh, fish and game stopped buying gravel to to put in the Sacramento River for for salmon when they stopped buying it from gravel miners who were taking it out of tributaries like uh, Cottonwood Creek you know so so th there are impacts on where you get the gravel for this uh, augmentation project um, and uh, well uh, one great source that that we've had are the old dredger tailings like along the Merced and Tuolumne rivers. And a lot of these uh, projects to, to isolate some of the old gravel pits and, and to add gravel to the system uh, were, were conceived and priced out based on these dredger tailings being worthless, which is what they were. But the, the, these restoration projects created a market for this stuff <laughs> and, then, uh, uh, and then the prices of course went up, but, but it does highlight that um, you need to get the gravel from somewhere. And uh, um, you know, where you have dredger tailings, that's a pretty good source. If you have to take it from other places, you're competing on this aggregate market for this aggregate, which is increasingly expensive. So I think, uh, I think there are questions about the long-term viability of the, the gravel augmentation, unless you take it from the reservoir itself. And then you get into all the costs of, uh, of the, you know, removing it, trucking it around, and um, the, and you have all these other institutional issues. A lot of these reservoirs were set up, you know, to to pass their cost benefit test. They had to make the reservoir a, a recreation area and uh, and an industrial activity like mining the, you know, ext extracting the the gravel and sand from the head of the reservoir that conflicts with its use as a recreational so. The recreational area. So there are all kinds of conflicts that arise with that. But that that's the sustainable way is taking it from the reservoir itself, just hard. So the second part of the question was, uh, mercury contamination also complicates dam removal and sediment management in California. Sediment flushing or bypassing doesn't appear to be viable in these reservoirs. So how might we deal with mercury contaminated reservoirs nearing capacity? Oof. Um, well, maybe, uh, uh, well, first, maybe the incoming sediment is not contaminated at this point. You probably need to check that. But if it seems like the incoming sediment is not so bad, um, you know, perhaps a, a bypass or, or even a, uh, a, a sluicing option, sediment routing might work. Um, but how you deal with uh, you know, decades of accumulation of uh, mercury contaminated sediment. That's the kind of problem I would turn over to someone like Mark. And that is a problem I would turn over to someone like Harry Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you know, uh, so my agency Valley Water manages reservoirs that are contaminated by the New Almaden Mining District, which is North America's largest historic mercury mine. And a lot of these reservoirs are built on old mine waste materials. Um, and they've received mining wastes overland throughout the years since 
you know, the early 1900s. And a few of these reservoirs have seismic retrofit projects planned. And so that's one of the things that we're considering, you know, or is it more appropriate to cap? Do we want to remove uh, some of the sediment to get some of the capacity back? Do we have to send that sediment out to Nevada and have it buried in the desert? <laughs> um, at, at a certain point, it gets prohibitively expensive and it goes back to that cost benefit question is, is it actually worth it? Um, it seems like capping, uh, seem, capping kind of seems to be the preferred method right now, given that. And uh, yeah, what, what Matt was talking about with cleaner sediment coming in is definitely true. Um, if you look at coring data in the, in the reservoirs, we definitely see that you can see a pr pretty predictable decrease um, in, in sediment mercury concentration with time. Carrie, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about Lake Combi, which is up in the Sierra Nevada. So outside of the region where Mark and I work, um, Lake Combi has a project to do some dredging out of it. But the mercury issue is extreme there. I was trying to look up. I don't remember how many gold mines were upstream that used mercury, but it's a very large number. And so this problem with reservoirs with contaminated sediment, if it still is coming in, then what you do within the reservoir to manage the sediment could quickly be erased in the next or, um, you know, over this decade. So there's some real considerations and there's no perfect solutions as we all know. Yeah, um, I, I know Combi is a, a good poster child, like you say, and I know um, um, another Carrie, Carrie Monahan with the Sierra Fund has been working on that project and um yeah it's it's a huge problem and um, um mercury and mercury methylation is beyond my area of expertise so um so i i can't really offer a solution there but uh, yeah i guess one more thing i'd mention is regarding sediment removals and mercury contaminated reservoirs uh you want to be careful that you're not exposing hotter sediment uh at when you remove sediment. So that might be another reason for just maintaining the lower capacity and dealing with it. Because it, it might be the case that, you know, you think you're removing a bunch of contaminated sediment, but then you end up removing a few meters and it's, you actually have that, you, you know, that 1890s sediment instead of the, mm. the modern day sediment. And so that might be a good segue into Mike Cox's next question who I believe actually lives downstream from a mercury contaminated reservoir. Uh, has any government, uh, has any government accomplished tort reform and insurance fund for downstream property impacts? Uh, has anyone used dynamic compaction to stabilize dam removal bottom sediments? A couple more questions in there, but maybe we'll start with those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, this question of liability for downstream, that, that's really key. And um, I, I don't think that's been addressed head on. Um, so I think the answer is no. Like in the case of the <coughs> San Clemente Dam, I was, I was a little surprised that it actually went through when you consider how wealthy and litigious some of the downstream property owners are. Um, but uh, but the but the model showed that you know it wouldn't the sediment contributions would not be so serious and uh, and would would not be creating flooding problems. Um, in terms of uh, dynamic compaction for um, sediments that are left behind that to be stabilized, um, I. The, well, I guess the main example would be San Clemente. I, 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 I know that at the, at the edges, at the ends, the downstream and the upstream ends, they, they, uh, well, they were certainly were doing some kind of compaction because they created these, uh, you know, these walls and then they, they protected them further, hardened them further. Um, 
but uh, what other examples do we have um, for for the Matillaha? There there was uh, I'm not sure if they were using dynamic compaction, but but the plan is to somehow stabilize some of the deposits along the margins so that the uh, sediments that that are that are released are metered out. They were also planning to uh, lower the level of the dam gradually to basically notch it so that uh, so that everything doesn't come out at once. So I don't have a good answer for that question, but but I have to say for both of them, not to my knowledge. Uh, I got another question just come in from Mark Butel. Um, Mark says the Mekong Delta case study was fascinating and scary. What is the long-term diagnosis for the Sa Sacramento San Joaquin Delta? Is it sediment starved and will it get flooded out with rising sea level? Yes and yes. <laughs> So um, it's, it's sediment star, but it, uh, it's a little different in that some of it is, um, some of it's self-inflicted in that, uh, you know, the Delta itself in 1850 was, was uh, full of fluffy sediments. You know, I mean, it was supporting plant life and everything, but uh, there was a lot of organics. And then just by, as, as you know, the story, just by, by uh, diking it off and draining it, and and running the pumps so that so that you could farm on the surface that was gradually subsiding, um, that uh, it was resulted in these you know islands so-called being far below sea level, and so I think it's um, it's 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 pretty clear to everybody that this is a disaster that's waiting to happen, um, and we don't really have a good uh, solution for it. Um, we, you know, we we have some experiments that have showed some positive results for for uh, regaining elevation within these quote islands, um, where you convert it back to wetlands and and you can get plants to grow and and you can start regaining some of that lost elevation. But a lot of the islands are still being used as agriculture, and by definition, those are still subsiding. So, so all we need is a good earthquake. And um, I think it's inevitable that uh, a lot of these dikes are going to fail, and uh, and rising sea level is just the icing on the cake in this, in this instance. I think. I had another question, Matt. Um, I was wondering if if new reservoirs are being built with sustainable sediment management in mind, or if that's more of like a reactive uh, management. Great question. Um, uh, in, in the Mekong, for example, uh, I was working with the Mekong River Commission and wrote the sediment section for their guidelines for main stem dams. And uh, these apply to the lower basin countries that are part of the Mekong River Commission and only for the main stem dams. But uh, <clears throat> the, first, the first two main stem dams that uh, you know, one is built and one is being built, um, they, they both in their uh, in their, you know, their plans, in their documents, they uh, accepted these principles that you want to pass a sediment through. Um, and uh, so at least in that case, and they, they did design some features like that. Uh, the questions still remained about how effective they would be and some of the details of the design. But, uh, but you know, you, you could say in that case, they were certainly, um, you know, there, there's certainly an intent, or at least a stated intent, to to pass sediment through. Um, there are a number of examples of uh, of dams built this way, sustainable sediment management, uh, in South America, Nepal, and um, uh, Africa. There are a bunch of examples all over, and certainly Japan. Japan and Switzerland are like the the two, you know, leading countries for sustainable sediment management innovations, um, but Taiwan also. Um, I did a study with my uh, former postdoc Shellen Huang. We were looking at um, how the how the Taiwanese uh, Water Resources Agency has been trying to implement some of these techniques now, and it's been forced on them. They they were in denial for a long time, but it's been forced on them because. In Taiwan, the central range of Taiwan, uh, you know, it's, it's uplifting 
um, a few inches a year and, and it's being eroded at the same rate. I mean, they have just massive sediment loads. And like us, they have seasonal rains. In their case, it's monsoonal, typhoonal rains in the summer and it's dry winter, but they, they depend on sediment, on reservoir storage, just as we do. And, uh, and so they've been implementing uh, some of this as well uh, in mostly in their case, mostly retrofits, but um, uh, certainly in the case of Japan, some of it's been new dams and, uh, and some of these other examples I mentioned, like on the Mekong, Nepal, and, and uh, some of the uh, dams in Peru and Colombia, these, these are new dams that are being built with uh, sediment passage in mind. Thanks. Um, so it looks like I have two more questions from Mike Cox and that's all I see. So if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat right now. Uh, the first one is, uh, is there any role of old soil conservation maps in your predictive models? Hmm. Um, I don't think I quite follow that. Soil conservation maps or, um, or spoil? Uh, did you want to chime in on that, Mike? Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, I seem to recall um, for a while, and at least in the US, they used to produce maps of the susceptibility of soils to erosion. I don't, I don't know what they were called or which agency produced okay. those. Oh, the NRCS maps. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, there certainly, there certainly could be. That, that would be um, a level of detail and, um, how should I say, uh, uh, determinism um, much greater than we employed in, in our 3W model. We, we were very uh, empirical and just sort of taking the results we, you know, where we had data on how much sediment had accumulated in these reservoirs. We converted those to sediment yields based on trap efficiencies and so on. So, um, so, so we, were, we were really black boxing the whole process. Um, what, what you're suggesting would be looking more deterministically at, at uh, where we would expect sediment to be coming from and how much. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so you could certainly improve the models with uh, trying to uh, incorporate some of those kinds of, uh, of um, analyses, but, but we didn't do it. And it looks like the, the last question for you is, uh, do you feel like sediment total maximum daily loads help, hurt, or don't matter in the context of dammed stream sediment management? Oh, good question. That's a whole different topic. Since we know that total maximum daily loads are not total, they're not maximum, they're not daily, and they're not loads. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have served a good purpose in, in many cases, but I'm not sure that would be the best um, framework for trying to analyze some of these uh, reservoir sedimentation issues. Um, you know, a lot of it would go back to the conceptual models that people had in mind when, when the Clean Water Act was written. And uh, you know, sediment was pretty much treated as a pollutant at that point. And um, now you know, we're trying to say there's, you know, there's good sediment. We need sediment in some cases. So um, um, I'd say that's still, still to be resolved is how we fit the reality of, of uh, these geomorphic and sediment processes in rivers to the framework of regulation that we've had for 50 years. Great, thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, and thanks again for a really good talk. That was super interesting. And seems like sediment transport applies to almost everything in our reservoir system. So we really appreciate your time. My pleasure, as you can tell, I, I'm happy to talk about the subjects. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the invite. Great, yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Oh, Great. and uh, I believe Matt everybody. will be possibly joining for a, a short amount of time on the expert panel on Friday. So feel free to tune in for that. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Okay, take care everybody. Thanks for the questions. Have a good one.